we'll just uh, we'll just jump right into it. Uh, thanks for signing up for the Edge of Field Water Quality Case Study Panel. Uh, I'm going to start uh, by just introducing the, the speakers. So Henry Donater, who just got a wonderful introduction, um, farms with his family in Southern Essex County, grows corn, soybeans, wheat. Uh, he's an Edge of Field cooperator, and as you just heard, uh, the cooperator for an enhanced demo site grow on farm going forward. So that's great. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Katie Stamler. So she's the source water protection manager with Essex Region Conservation Authority. And then uh, lastly, Mary Belize is the healthy watersheds manager at Asalba Bayfield Conservation Authority. And Mary's gonna be taking uh, the key takeaways from this panel discussion and present them to the, to the larger group later on. Um, the way this will work, we're gonna have a presentation from Katie and Henry. Uh, after that, we'll have a, a brief sort of facilitated discussion and then we'll open it up to uh, the, the audience. So if you've got questions kind of through the presentation or through that first bit of discussion, uh, throw them into the chat and then I'll, uh, I'll read them out. And if we need clarification from you, you can unmute your mic, but just use the chat and throw your questions in there. I think that's it for housekeeping. So Katie, do you want to, Katie and Henry, do you want to start it off? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I'm going to start off um, just with some discussion about what Edgefield uh, research looks like. And then I'm going to hand it over to Henry to talk about his experiences as a, as a farmer with some Edgefield uh, sites on his farms. So um, I'd be remiss to not talk about our other partners from the Maitland and Asabal and Upper Thames and Lower Thames. We're all doing edge of field research um, and we all are, are at different stages with, with our edge of field research. In the Essex region, we're still a little bit new to edge of field research um, and trying to get our sites up and running and work through some of the kinks where some of our other partners like Barry have been doing their edge of field work for a number of years. So we really are appreciative and, and lean on, our, on those other partners who have been doing that edge of field research for some time. And you've seen these maps before, so just to give you an idea of where these edge of field locations are. So when we talk about edge of field research um, and why we do it, so this image on the left here is uh, one of the swales on Henry's farm where we do the edge of field research. And you can see that it's collecting that surface water and, and running off the field. So what we want to know is how much water and how much nutrients are moving off of the field during those rain events. So it gives us that really fine scaled information about uh, how nutrients move off of farm fields. So we can measure in the watershed, you know, but, but this gives us a better idea of, of the farm scale um, loss of nutrients. So Henry had these swales already. So what we did is um, we installed these weirs, which Henry actually made. They were designed by Kevin McKegg at Omafra uh, to meet the, the, we actually went out and we measured and figured out what the size of each watershed is of these little swales. And then Henry uh, designed and built these, um, these V-notch weirs for us. And then we have a little mini ISCO set up there. And in here is a, a level logger that tells us the, the height of the water that's out in the field. And sometimes when we get these rain events, we even get this treat of these blue herons that come out and, uh, and check out to see what's going on on the fields. And you can see the water pouring off of the V-notch weir here. So that allows us, we know what the size of that is so we can tell how much water is moving over. And then we collect the samples and we get an idea of what the nutrients are in there. So this is a great schematic that Chris shared with us from, uh, from their sites that give you an idea um, where, we're, where we're able to collect both overland and tile flow. So in the Essex region, we, we don't have a lot of headers. So in this particular site, we're not measuring tile flow, but there is another location where we can. So the, the headers in the, the, um, for the tile flow can be tapped into with, uh, with an agar drain and brought over to, uh, to an ISCO auto sampler so we can get that tile flow. And we can use overland flumes to collect that uh, overland flow from, uh, from surface water before it all goes out into uh, the drain. And then normally we also will have some sort of weather station involved with that. And this just to give you an idea of the different kinds of setups that we might have. Some of them are a little bit more permanent. And we have, uh, I think this is in the Maitland where they've got these beautiful wooden sheds. For us, this situation um, is a little bit more um, temporary. So we don't have these beautiful like, um, shed set up here at this particular site. So we have to bring these tubs out every time and these have our ISCOs in them. 
And I was really um, heartened to hear uh, Dr. Faulkner talk about um, winter sampling as it is really challenging. We just had a, a great warm up and small rain event last week where you know, the, the water levels came up and we were like, cool, we're going to capture that. But it immediately froze and we had a snowstorm. So we actually weren't able to collect any of those samples because they froze in the ISCOs. Um, so you, you know, you're trying to capture those those snow events and those melt events and it's really challenging and again we had a warm-up yesterday where uh, you know a lot of our snow here in the Essex region melted but um, it's immediately cold and snowing again so it's it's quite difficult to capture that and again also you just have this challenge of moving your samples through the snow so we all have sleds in our vehicles to to help us move those those samples around. Uh, some of the successes and challenges that we as conservation authorities and the people who are doing the edge of field research face is that, you know, the successes are that we get these amazing relationships with our, uh, with our farmers and the growers and we're, you know, we're working to solve a common challenge. So um, that's a big benefit for us. And that, as I said, working with the other conservation authorities, combining our expertise and sharing our knowledge across watersheds is huge. Um, learning just valuable information about our watersheds that we didn't know before. And our challenges. Uh, the weather and planning is is huge just trying to you know are you going to have a big enough rain event that's going to trigger edge of field um, runoff and how are you going to get your equipment out there we also have you know henry's trying some different trials but the, the weather plays a huge factor right so uh, he put in buckwheat this year but it went in a little bit uh, later because it was wet and then it didn't really take off so we have a change in in what the plan is and we have to be able to adapt to that and, and have an understanding that that's always going to happen. We have equipment failures and troubleshooting. Uh, these are inevitable in the field. So just, you know, these are these are real challenges that we have to face. And of course we had COVID-19 restrictions and just, uh, you know, we were able to be out in the field, but certainly lots of other um, restrictions for how that was going. And I'm gonna hand it over to, to Henry now to talk about his experience. Thanks, Katie. Uh... I'm not sure this my my picture wants to come up, but oh, it's okay, Henry. I'm sharing the slides. Okay, so there you go. So um, I'm Henry Denotter, and this is uh, we're actually at a field. This is the the actual field that uh, Katie has been showing. Um, wheat has been harvested, and that little dust in the back there, you can hardly see it. We are actually planting a buckwheat that day. So <clears throat> you might as well carry on, Katie. Go to the next slide. Okay. So this is, this is Weigel Creek. So Weigel Creek actually starts in the middle of the county and is a, uh, a municipal drain. And it's a pretty fast moving drain. And this is taken off of a bridge um, across the, one of our fields. It's about 26 feet from the bridge bottom, bottom to the uh, water, water surface. And, uh, and yes, it is, does move, uh, move along quite quickly. And, you can see see where we're at. Weigel Creek is where we're uh, is the, that little uh, triangle that we've got sitting there. So that's the the land that basically we know drains directly into the creek. So next slide there, Katie. So now um, this is what started this whole episode. Kate, Katie and I got together back in about two fifteen, actually, maybe even earlier, and we were talking about water quality, runoff, cover crops. Cover crops were uh, being used. We had done some cover crop work and we don't necessarily get every field with a cover crop. But I had suggested that we go to this field. Uh, I said, it's got man-made swells in it. Like all these swells that we're working off of, they're all man-made. The previous owner has made them or we have enhanced them. And so therefore, it says it's pretty easy to, uh, to work with. But uh, up here on, to, on the top right is uh, bare, bare soil, uh, wheat's off. We sprayed it, actually we sprayed it several times so there was no growth. On the left, we put a, a light cover crop in, uh, some uh, western oats, uh, a few radishes and so forth. And then on the bottom is what, after a significant rainfall, what the water samples look like. So this was like kind of the OHA moment. And you look at some of the numbers there, some of the phosphorus levels, the, uh, the dirt particles numbers, uh, and uh, that started the whole conversation going that maybe we need to uh, try and get a handle on it. And then of course the uh, on-farm program came along and 
one thing led to another. So let's go to the next slide. So there you are. So this is the field we're working on, circled in red. And you can actually see some shadows of where, how it's been farmed and where some of the tile drains are. The, the, right in the middle, there is a, actually a kind of a goofy network of tiles. I had nothing to do with that. They were there. Uh, and on the right, uh, we've seen this already a few times. This is the V-notch designed by Kevin McKay uh, and the ESCO units to take the samples. Uh, uh, all the um, outlets are done right. They all have uh, riparian stone in them to uh, try and control it. Uh, we've got grass berm. And the beauty of this site actually is, number one, Weigel Creek is uh, across the road. The road runs right alongside of the, uh, the field. So um, the teams can get to it easily, just park on the side of the road. We've got an elevate, there are elevated berms that uh, kind of protect the farm and it's, it's relatively square and we do have a little bit of history of it. Okay, let's go to the next. Uh, so here we are in the uh, 24th of uh, June. So there, uh, <clears throat> those are uh, soybeans in there. We are putting loggers in there and some of the different shots below what uh, different dates. Um, when you get a look, even just a little bit of rainfall, it's amazing how much, uh, how much the water backs up. And just to, to, to prove to you that we're not lying, we didn't rig it. The right uh, shot has got one of the rain gauges that I stuck in there. Just out of curiosity, I had it in the truck and I said, let's put this rain gauge in here. And uh, I came back the next morning and I go, whoa. You know? And of course, the, uh, the new lake didn't help at, uh, help at all. But the whole idea of being part of the on-farm program is uh, I like, and the why, why I'm participating, I really want to see what is going on firsthand. And uh, the, the IRCA team has got some great, uh, great people. Uh, Craig, unfortunately lost. And Craig, you owe me for that picture that you used of my sign. If you're, if you're on, that's my butter, my uh, pollinator sign. But anyway, so let's go to the next picture. So there you can see the a couple of different uh, different stages of cropping, um, some of our different swells that are put in place. Um, those uh, stainless steel panels uh, go approximately four to six inches in the uh, in the ground uh, to make sure we get uh, to capture all the water. And you can't see it very well, but we have added wings to it to make sure that nothing nothing escapes and. Uh, our, uh, our drop shoots have, hold, have been holding up well. And uh, Craig, there's a sign in the uh, background. Okay, let's go to the next. So there, there's, this leads to another project. When you get started on one thing, you get uh, talking to more people and more researchers. So that brought us into uh, the Living Labs project. So we do have a Living Labs site, which is downstream about uh, three miles. And we have three fields in it. Um, we're going to try and keep, uh, and I said try, try and keep the three crop rotation going, trying to do a, as much enhancements as possible to keep soil health uh, going and keep uh, a good uh, level of fertility and production. Uh, we've accomplished some of that already. Uh, we already messed up. Uh, we had an opportunity and we didn't do it. We should have probably spread Cereal, cereal rye in the uh, cornfield, which is the top uh, right uh, field that the other one that Katie's just indicating. But we did get a cover crop on the lower field, which was wheat. And uh, again, late, lots of rain. Um, you, you know, you had to kind of pick your day and, and you go out there and say, okay, it's, it's dry enough. Like, let's get something done today. And uh, we're talking 70 acre fields, 50 acre fields. So it, uh, you can't do it in 20 minutes. So, uh, and they're, they're not square, like especially that lower field, that's a big field. And there's a lot of data that uh, is accomplished there. But also in that lower field, the picture in the right is the, uh, is the whole uh, surface water system that's set up there to collect surface water. And on the other side of it, um, we have a, a main drain uh, collection system. So the three collection sites do cover um, 
surface water and tile water. We've got some data. I'm not, I don't have anything to share, but uh, we, we can pin that on somebody else. Yeah. Okay. What do you, and, you know, um, Josh, you, you kind of caught me off guard when you uh, showed the, uh, the Russian dolls, but <laughs> I don't know if we beat you to it, but we have our own little symbol. We've created this here uh, during the summer, and uh, this is the fish because it's all about the water. So uh, Lauren, one of uh, Katie's associates, put together some uh, um, <clears throat> descriptions on what the different parts make. Um, so we have built a bunch of these things and we just keep them around and we have somebody interested. Uh, uh, as anybody that's really part of our project probably could end up with one, but this is the whole symbol of what it's all about. And uh, you know what? This fish isn't probably good eating, but he's uh, <laughs> still be around for a long time. Anyways, that is, uh, that is basically what we're doing. Uh, again, uh, like Josh said too, these projects take years to develop mm -hmm. and you finally get them going and then somebody, um, you know, moves a fence post, a farm gets sold or uh, people lose interest, but we, we're working hard to try and get a system going. Uh, cover crop is part of it. We did concentrate for the last five years on buckwheat uh, as our main cover crop. We did use some cereal cover crops and so now we're going to, after a couple of uh, almost disasters, we uh, need to uh, maybe change or broaden our scope a little bit. Uh, again, I could go on for on for hours. There's different podcasts out there um, and other presentations. But anyway, I thank uh, thank you for listening, and I thank the uh, the staff at IRCA that helped me put this together. And uh, you know, just a, a pleasure to work with. Likewise, Henry, and and this this fish is is all Henry's vision. All we did was was listen to him and put his words into it. So uh, so we really appreciate that. And and having Henry's vision and and his motto of it's all about the water is really motivational for us. So uh, that's what that's what Henry and I had to to share. So happy to answer any questions or chat or anything. Thank you, Katie and Henry. At this time, I'm going to ask. Uh... Mary Valise to to uh, unmute and, and show her camera as well. I'll start us off with a few questions, but in, in the audience, you can start typing them in. We've got about 10 minutes here for discussion. So Henry, Henry, I wanted to start with you. You talked about that aha moment where you saw the two water samples. Uh, and so that's clearly, you're seeing the water quality benefit of the practices. I was hoping you could elaborate a bit on maybe the other benefits to your operation from, from cover crops that you're seeing or maybe some of the, the challenges? Well, like, it, again, that was that, that aha moment, you know, that, that is, that's what started it all. And that's when we started talking to different people uh, about uh, specialized cover crops. Uh, I'll have to give Adam Hayes a, a little credit there because he would come over and, and a couple of different bags of different uh, seeds and say, you know, you ready to put some cover crop plots in? And I'd say, yeah, okay, let's let's do this again. And that particular field was full of uh, cover crop plots and it was sponsored basically by the grain farmers and some of the local, uh, local co-ops because they really wanted to see or demonstrate for our strategies. So we had quite a little, uh, you know, summer, but that was 10 years ago, we could, we were doing that. So that's got things going in. And what happened was one of the cover crops got away on us. And it was uh, November 1st, we had five feet of growth and it wasn't stopping. And I said, what are we gonna do with this? And it was pretty thick. So uh, I went and seen a local dairy farmer and I just, I just gave it away. I says, come and get it, get it out of here because I don't know if I'm gonna be able to deal with it. You know, talking to a couple other uh, fellow uh, uh, directors from soil and crop that says, ah, don't worry about it, it'll be all right. But yeah, I was new in the game. So uh, I, uh, I panicked, cut it. I think we took off 125 round bales of a combination of, uh, of oats and peas and different things. Again, the dairy farmer was pretty happy because the heifers had something to eat all winter. So that's the way it goes. 
But so then I said, well, you know what? If we can do that, why don't we look at a cover crop that maybe we can harvest? So that's what we got to do with buckwheat. But the buckwheat has a lot of other things that go with it. The fact that uh, I really like the pollinator uh, friendly attitude. We've been bringing bees in and try to interact with other groups in the agricultural industry. So all of a sudden, uh, a very simple um, crop like buckwheat multiplies by four because there's so many other advantages. Like it's just the beginning. Yeah. It's a really interesting but part that's about- That's where it goes. About, it's a really interesting part about the, the edge of field research in that you're, you're not just sort of trying to sort out the water quality piece. There's also the learning around mm -hmm. the actual BMPs themselves that is, is continual. So it's a really, really nice, uh, nice combo. Uh, I wanted to uh, jump over to uh, Katie and, and maybe Mary wanted to chime in too. Um, Wonder if you could speak a bit just about sort of the, the weather in twenty uh, in twenty twenty one. Just what was it? You know, how do you how do you see that impacting the story? And if you could speak just about that that variability and what that means for the study. Sure. Uh, I mean, every year is is different, and you you know you start to think that you've got a handle on the weather and, and that things are going to go well, and and then everything changes. Um, you know, so we, we had a very dry summer, so we didn't, we had very few events in the summertime, and then we had a very wet fall. And one of our challenges, because we don't have permanent setups at uh, where Henry's Edgerfield site is, we had such a large rain event that it actually, no matter how well we tied them up, it knocked over the bins that the ISCOs were in. And so that meant that any sample that we got was was lost anyway. So, you know, you're dealing with you know, just things that are out of your control um, with the weather. And again, with the, you know, the snow melt and everything else is, is quite challenging. So I, every single year you're facing a new and different challenge that you, you think you've got a handle on and then something different happens the following year. I just want to add to that about the weather and why it is so important that we are working with the modelers at the University of Guelph because if we were to be looking at, you know, people have a lot of expectations about the water quality information, and in a couple of years, they want to know how one thing works or another mm -hmm. thing works. Well, if you have a wet year and you're trying something, and weather will absolutely overwhelm what you're trying to see with the BMP. And so that's why it is so important that we are capturing the information that the, the professors at the University of Guelph are able to um, you know, mimic those situations that are happening across the landscape or with the weather and, and how the stream is, how the stream flow is following the weather and the different practices. And then we can take out factors like the weather to really evaluate how these best management practices are performing. And I know that that sounds, uh, made it sound maybe a little bit easy, but it, it's quite a lot of data mm -hmm. that is required to make our hydrology um, similar when we do these models. And so I, I just wanna make that plug that this work is really interesting um, in the time that we do it. And we're looking at the field and the information and the runoff and I'm great, I'm so great that Henry got to see, you know, those, those samples come off that no cover crop and cover crop field. But, we're not, we can't rely only on those events to demonstrate some of the BMP, the BMP effectiveness. We really have to understand things at the field and the watershed scale. And that's really where some of the modeling work comes in. For sure. And, and I think, um, you know, Josh really hit on it in that uh, initial talk, right? That it's, it takes time and you have to have multiple years worth of data and different, you know, you're looking at different crop types, you're looking at different weather scenarios and, um, you know, that that one photo we have is is great, but it's one event where we happen to successfully collect a sample. So it's it certainly tells a story, but it's not, um, you know, it's not the end all and, and be all. So we're starting to get some good questions coming in, into the chat. So I think we'll hop over. First, I think uh, Josh Joshua Faulkner was uh, putting in an order for one of those tools, Henry. So maybe I'll <laughs> nail one across the border. <laughs> get it there. Uh, there are some questions about the uh, details about the cover crop. So um, confirming when was the buckwheat sown 
And then there was another question about um, other than having winter harvested corn, when would you really not want to put in a cover crop? Could you address those, Henry? Well, we are we would not put in a uh, cover crop uh, in co corn most of the time um, because um, contrary to the norm, we plant all our corn, all our beans, uh, 20 inch rows. So that is, is fairly tight and we need that path um, bare and collecting sunlight in the, uh, in the spring and drying out so we can plant. But see, corn is only one part of the rotation. And if uh, I don't think I'd wanna have, you know, 1400 acres of uh, cover crop on, on a field and then have to deal with it all within one week because that just wouldn't work. I have to have a, a whole plan. And I want to make comment there to uh, Mary about the uh, like the modeling. Like modeling is definitely important, but without people like myself and others uh, to start and just show something, uh, like nobody get interested in modeling. Mm -hmm. Like, and and I realize that we're just giving you one aha moments or one little uh, little tidbit, but uh, also I believe. Uh, between the different groups, uh, sometimes I will have a hundred scientists on a on a meeting just to dis discuss what's going on, and I let them take out whatever they want. But I'm going to keep on doing the same thing. I'm the benchmark because I'm setting up what I'm going to do. And every morning, um, if there has to be a made a decision, I guess I'm the last man standing. I'm going to make the decision what we're going to do. Uh, I, that's absolutely right. We need those aha moments and we need to put them in context of the of the broader scales. But if we don't have the aha moments, then we're all of us don't have very much of a story to tell. So we cannot uh, underestimate how important those kinds of um, events or, or samples, mm -hmm. collections or working together. And I'm so grateful to folks like Henry and the folks that we have in Gully Creek and folks up in um, Garvey Glen and then the Medway and, and different producers all the way around because it, at the end of the day, it really does come back to um, producers telling those different aha moment stories. So appreciate that point. So we're down, we're down to our last two minutes and I think there's a, a number of more questions coming in. One, uh, just a quick one, is there any preliminary data available? And I was curious if this, someone could speak to the, the overall intent of, of on-farm is to make uh, this data publicly available. I'm uh, bogging on the timeline, if anyone. Yeah, I'm not sure on that either, Chris. Um, right now, no, Keith, there, there's no preliminary data to share at the moment, um, at least not for us. Um, you know, as I said, things are, we're just sort of still getting our feet wet a little bit with it. Um, but the data are all shared with uh, with Wen Hong as, as it becomes available so that he can incorporate that into uh, into the work. A lot of the a lot of the comments in the chat are really just echoing support for that idea of you need the long term data, uh, which is it's very true. And, and uh, keynote speaker spoke to that as well. And that idea of the different perspectives. Uh, Ryan or Tracy Ryan made that point in the in the chat too. So important. All these pieces, the modeling, that the in field lab lab experiments, they all sort of play a really important role in, in teasing out. The story. Um, just scanning through the chat. Chris, there was a question about uh, the uh, the buckwheat. Everything, oh, all yeah. buckwheat is is seeded. It's all seeded with an air seeder. Um, any any cover crop is seeded with uh, with an air seeder. We're not spreading very little is spread on top. Maybe uh, you know cereal rye and corn stalks if they if we uh, do that, but we haven't done very much. But all our cover crops are, are done in seeded in the soil. Welcome back, everybody. As you're rejoining the uh, main room, just might want to mute yourself again if you were having a good conversation in the breakout room and have your microphone on. That would be a good time just to mute yourself again and. Looks like getting most people back now. Well, I was in the edge of field water quality session and it was such a 
fantastic conversation there. So I hope the same was this, uh, true for the soil health session. And just to make sure we all get a chance to at least hear the highlights of the, both the sessions, we do have Mary Villies and Woody Van Arkel uh, to share some highlights from those sessions. Mary is from the Asabel Bayfield Conservation Authority and Woody uh, is from Van Arkel Farms and also the Ontario Soil Network. And they have kindly agreed to share some key takeaways from both the sessions. So Mary, I'll start with you if you don't mind and just some very high level kind of key takeaways. I really want to uh, uh, thank everybody for uh, participating in that discussion. And we had a really great a um, couple of presentations from uh, Katie Stamler and Henry Donater, and we uh, learned a little bit about the who, what, where, when, and why we do these samples, um, and we got introduced to this uh, fish wrench that uh, Henry and the team at, at Essex put, uh, made that shows um, a vision for soil and water conservation and increased yields and how the the ribs of the of the fish are really these different tools that we can use to improve soil health yield and water quality and we have to have the eye kind of keeping an eye on how our practices are making a difference um, so I thought that was a really fitting uh, wrench tool and I don't know if that can be shared there's Katie's going to share it there we go that's great so I, the other thing that we really had a great discussion about, and sometimes we can get a little bit um, lost in our different perspectives, but the, the need for this longer term data because uh, of the weather conditions that happened in 2021, um, if you just had a one or two year study, you really would have a hard time showing some of these BMPs um, uh, and the effect is effectiveness of them. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, that information will help to feed the models. But really, it is those times when we are having those side by side comparisons, and we can really show maybe some water quality samples that really provide that kind of aha moment of the differences between the different um, cropping practices and really show, you know, when we show those water samples and the water quality is more clear in one and, and more muddy in another you know, and, and some of the producers are able to tell that story about what they did, that really does resonate with a lot more people. So although there are many perspectives to take, it's really the combination of, of these different perspectives that will help us um, move forward in, in implementing more of those tools that help to improve yields, um, soil health and water quality. I hope I've covered what people were trying to get across at that in that workshop, but if there's any other comments, I guess, put them in the chat and hope to clarify um, further work going forward. Thanks. Yeah, no, great uh, job, Mary. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it was just struck me as well. The fish was wonderful, but also that importance of collaborating at the field level with farmers and right through to the modelers at the University of Guelph. So everybody plays an important role. So I think that came across to me as well. So thanks for sharing those highlights. And Woody, over to you for the soil health key takeaways and highlights. Well, I'll try to do my best as well. Um, there was a lot of commonality between uh, Ed and Tyler, uh, even though they're on both extremes of the soil, Tyler being uh, a heavier clay farm and uh, Ed being sandy. Um, they both, and I think this is common to a lot of people in a lot of farmers that have committed to soil health, it, it's been a a long journey. Uh, it didn't happen overnight to where they are. They started by reducing tillage and adding amendments or introducing cover crops. So it's, it isn't an overnight thing. It's been a journey for all of them. And it's both have come with challenges. Uh, there's always been a challenge or an issue to overcome and, and they just continue to work at it. It's a long-term commitment. Uh, and they realize that uh, changes don't always happen uh, overnight on a farm. Uh, so it takes two or three, four or five years sometimes to, uh, to see these changes uh, bear fruit. Uh, both Ed and Tyler have a, a long-term commitment to uh, on-farm research, whether it's just trying different practices, making observations, or actually putting in plots. I think that's common amongst a lot of farmers that are working on soil health uh, on their farm is to do these uh, uh, research trials. 
Um, some of the benefits that both have seen over, over their journey and changes uh, is better, more, uh, more even crops. Their, their uh, systems have taken some of the fluctuations out of the poorer areas in the farm and things like that. Their soils are more forgiving uh, due to the extremes, whether it's dry, dry weather or uh, rain events. There's, um, like I said, more resilience, I guess, in their soils because of that. Uh, they see reduced erosion because they're keeping things covered. They're keeping roots in the ground to hold things together, things like that. And with uh, long-term BMPs, uh, their soil indicators, such as organic matter, aggregate stability, I'm going to guess water infiltration. I'm drawing a blank. Sorry, um, are all looking better as they go through these practices. So that was a lot of commonalities between two di two different farms. So if that sums it up, I hope I did a good job. Super. Thanks, Woody. That's really great and a uh, yeah, good summary. And if anybody has anything to add to that session. Uh, please feel free to put it in the chat, but it's good to have those summaries so we know what happened in the other sessions. And just as a reminder, we'll be pulling together all the information into a report that will be shared with all the participants as well. So thanks Woody and Mary for sharing those highlights from the two concurrent sessions.